We're going back to our new series that we started called Gifted, Made for a Purpose. You are gifted for a purpose. Gifted for a purpose. A lot of times, like we talked about last week when we started this, people have always struggled with the question, what is my purpose in life? And we titled this for a reason, Gifted for a Purpose, because part of finding your purpose is understanding that you've been gifted. And so we looked at last week how in that search for what is our gift, I don't fully understand, or what is my purpose, I don't fully understand my purpose, that you may not understand it in the big picture, but that God gives you certain guides in life to help you get to that place where you will understand your purpose. And maybe it's not your end-all purpose, but it's your purpose for the moment at least. Because we follow God day by day. And so we learned in Philippians, Paul was talking to the churches in uh, Philippi chapter 2, verse 13, and he says, here's two guides that God has given you to help you find your purpose in life. Number one, God has given you a desire. Not a worldly desire, not a worldly passion, but he has given you a desire. What are the desires that when you became a Christian that he deposited inside of you that will help guide you towards finding out what your purpose is in life? If you pay attention, there will be stirrings that take place inside of you to help you get there. The second thing that he says in that scripture is that he has given you a power. That he has deposited the Holy Spirit inside of you and that The power inside of you is then worked out of you, and the way that it's worked out of you is through the gifting that God has given you. Like, we want to see the presence of God amongst us. We want to see the presence of God in our community and around the world, but do you know the way the world will see the presence of God inside of you is by you using your gift because it's the spout that needs to be turned on for people to even witness the presence of God. And that's what I want to show you this morning is as you try to find your purpose in life, you understand that God has gifted every single person. He's given every individual a purpose. Then why has he gifted you? So if you're a believer here this morning in Jesus Christ, you've got to understand you have a gift. And the question this morning is, Why did God give you, who sit out there today and believe in Jesus Christ, this gift? Why did he give you this gift or multiple gifts? That's what I want to answer this morning. Number one, if he has given you a gift, and we know the scriptures say that he has, the gift that he's given you is so that you will help other people. A lot of the scriptures I'm going over today is what we'll be using throughout this entire series. But Paul tells the church in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, he says a spiritual gift is given to each of us. And again, does that exclude anybody? No, it doesn't. So every believer has a gift. A spiritual gift is given to each of us. It doesn't matter if you've been saved one day, you've accepted Jesus Christ into your life, one day, If you've only been a Christian one day, God will give you a gift. And that gift is meant to help each other. It says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Everybody say help. Help each other. That's why you've been given a gift. Now, sometimes we have to define even simple words. And so I feel it's important to define the word help here. The idea of the word help in the original language actually means uh, that you will help somebody carry their burden. What I want to make clear, because this is in so much in our society today, is that there's a difference between helping out and helping up. That's why I want to define it. Because I don't believe the kingdom of God is built on handouts. It's built built on hand up, helping people up. A lot of people, they think that they're only being loved by Christians and by God if they get handouts. But true love is sometimes kicking somebody in the hiney and saying, get up, do this. You don't need another handout in life. I'm here to help you up and help you move forward in life. 
So there's defining help doesn't mean we're constantly just helping people out or we're doing them no good. And in that scripture, that's what we're talking about. The gifts are given for you to help each other. But it's not just to help each other stay where you're at. It's to help each other move forward in life. And you see this in the original definition. The original definition means to bear. So what does bear mean? Bear means that you're going to come alongside somebody who's got weight on their shoulders. And you're going to come up underneath them. And mind you, this isn't you. This is your gifting. Because we're talking about spiritual gifts in this scripture. So your gifting is going to bring you together, bring together to help bear the weight that is upon the individual in that moment. To help them bear it. But if you just help them bear the weight, what will it do? It's like somebody like puts, you know, a squat rack. They they get up under a squat rack and they just hold the weight like this. Is that going to do anything for them? No, eventually what it will do for them is drop them to the ground, break their knees probably, and smash their face into the floor if all they're doing is holding the weight, right? You've actually got to do something with the weight in order to get through why the weight's on you. So whether it's squatting or moving forward with it, whatever it might be. So the second part of help actually means in the Greek to carry. So you don't just come up under and help carry their burden and leave them where they are, but the idea is to begin to help them as you're helping bear the burden, move forward in life and carry them forward. And then finally, that word in the original language means to be profitable. So the fact that you're willing to help somebody who would otherwise be crushed bear up under their weight, and help move them forward, in the end, it's going to add value to their faith. Because now their faith will have been made stronger and have the ability to endure and last through a trial that would be similar in life. And you see this played out throughout Scripture. An example of this would be when Paul's writing the church in Thessalonica. And Thessalonica has been going through some troubles. And so in his letter to them, he describes what they did and why they did it. And he says in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he writes to them, he says, Finally, when we could stand it no longer, meaning Paul and all the people that he was traveling with, when they could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy to visit you. Timothy was Paul's... uh, mentee his protege in life he's come up underneath Paul traveling around spreading the good news he's learned what it means to minister to people and so Paul's like listen I understand you guys are going through some trouble I can't be there right now that's not what God has called me to do as the apostle he's got me on another mission but I understand you're struggling so in the meantime I'm going to send somebody else who has gifts that will help you out So the verse goes on, he says, he is our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. We sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles that you were going through. But you know that we are destined for such troubles. Why did Paul send Timothy to the church that was going through trouble in Thessalonica? Three reasons. To strengthen them, to encourage them, and to keep them from their faith being shaken. But notice he ends that like he says, but you know that you're all destined for such troubles. You know, I think about sometimes the songs we sing on Sunday morning or the sermons that I preach. Sometimes, you know, I, I have to think about who I'm preaching to. I realize at times that our songs may appeal to people that are at a certain place in life, but not others, such as two of our songs today talked about being broken. And not everybody here this morning is broken. But what you have to understand, according to what Paul said, is that whether you're broken now or not, there will be a day when you are broken. And so it's important for us to understand how do we deal with life uh, in brokenness, whether it's today Or tomorrow, it's going to come. We're all destined for trouble in life. But you have been given a gift, every single one of you. And part of the reason that you were given that gift is so that when you see people around you who are broken, that gift is meant to help them 
in their brokenness. It's help to help them keep their faith and not just keep it, but to keep an even keel through all of life's storms. So you have been gifted with a purpose. Understand, part of that purpose, if you pay attention to the people around you, is sometimes, you know, people get shaky in their faith. And when I think about people being shaky in their faith, I think about that, that bar of weights being on somebody. And you, if you've ever watched somebody try and squat a lot of weight, sometimes their knees start to shake. And you know they should probably just put the bar back and quit, right? But uh, they've got to get through it. So if they had to get through it because it's life, their knees would be shaken. And before their knees buckle, somebody's got to come up under the weight and help them with that weight, Maybe it's their last rep, and they're like, one more rep. This is how we're going to build your strength. And their knees are shaking, and so somebody comes up, and they help the weight. They spot them. They help lift the weight. But they just don't leave them where they're at. They help them carry that weight. So it's building muscles inside of them as they're bearing that burden in life. Your gift is for that reason. And though Timothy was sent to this church to use his gifts for that specific reason. Some people here may think, well, I'm not Timothy. Maybe you don't even know much, much about Timothy, but if his name's mentioned in the Bible, then obviously he's somebody special, and you don't have the gifts that Timothy has, so what can you do? And what you have to understand is it doesn't matter if you're Timothy or not, if you have the same giftings or not. Maybe you do and you don't realize it. Maybe you don't, but the bottom line is, according to Scripture, you have been given a gift for sure, at least one, if not more, that gives you the ability to help people that are around you. Depending on your gifting, you may help people differently. Like you think, well, what could my gift do? Maybe you, you feel like your gift is like kind of the odd gift out. Like, I don't know how my gift will really help people who are going through stuff. But I think about all the different giftings. Say somebody that's across the aisle from you is going through something, and you realize, oh, that person's going through something. What can I do to help them? Well, you know what? There's all sorts of different giftings, which we'll go through next week. But just to touch on, on, on a few of them, if you're a prophet and you see somebody going through someone, people who, are, who flow in the prophetic might come to that person and say, listen, I see that you're going through some stuff. And I just want to tell you that God's word would say this to you and begin to prophesy what God might be speaking to that person. And sometimes what they have to say isn't the easiest to hear. Like you've been going through some things, but right now you're reaping what you've sown. And you really need to repent for the things that you've been doing. And if you would simply repent and return to God, things would begin to turn around and, and begin to minister to them in that way. And that might be exactly what that person needed to hear in that moment. But then a teacher comes along, and the teacher comes to that person, and he, they say, you know what, here's what the Bible says, and here's, you know, how, how it worked out in biblical times, and begins to teach them God's word to help them through that moment. And then somebody with the gift of mercy comes along, and, and the gift of mercy walks up to them and gives them a great big hug and just begins to love on them right where they are. And then somebody with the gift of service or helps, they see that person because they live across the street from them. And they're like, you know, they've had so much going on in their life. Their lawn's getting crazy. I'll go mow their lawn for them. Or they, they obviously, maybe they haven't had time to eat. They've just had too many. They're coming and going all the time. Maybe I'll bring a meal to them. And so in their gifting, they go and minister to that person with the gift of helps or service. And sometimes we think, well, what I, what, how does our gifting help people? It doesn't matter. You may feel like you have a peculiar gift, but all gifts serve the same purpose, to help other people. And to be honest, the bigger problem is not typically people wondering how their gift can help. The bigger problem is getting Christians to wake up and realize they've been given a gift for this purpose. And getting them to wake up each and every morning and ask God, God, how can I use my gift that you have so graciously given me to strengthen other people's faith today? Can you imagine if you woke up every single day like that? Like some people might be thinking here, well, how come nobody's, you know, done that to me? 
Now, no, I don't want anybody thinking this morning like, uh, why has somebody not been using their gifts to help me because I'm going through something? Like, I'm not talking about being a victim here. I'm talking about Christians who will step up to the plate and do what God's called them to do. And believe it or not, you use your gift to help somebody else. Whatever it is that you're going through will more than likely uh, be taken care of. You know, just this last week, uh, I had somebody I was talking with and counseling with. And they're going through a bout of depression. So how can I help this person? Well, I can talk until I'm blue in the face, but that's not going to bring you out of depression. So they said, like, I need some sunshine. My answer to them was, sometimes you've got to create your own sunshine. Quit being a victim to your circumstances and do something about it. So how do you do something about it is you go out and give out of what you've been given by God. And so I brought them to the nursing home, and we began to visit people. And so in visiting people, the first couple people, the response was, how is this going to help me? But do you know that after we got done visiting several people, sitting down, talking to them, loving on them, literally give them a hug and a kiss and just let them talk to you, by the time we walked out of there, that person's heart and their circumstances for the moment was absolutely changed. Because they used what God had given them. Like we can all play victim, but you will never have victory over what you're victim to. So the question isn't, what can somebody do for me? But the question this morning is, what can you do for others? Because you've been gifted by God to help, to help other people. And I really think if we got this inside of us and we woke up every single morning and every single morning our prayer would be, God, I pray that you would help me to see the opportunities that are before me to use my gift today to strengthen other people. I guarantee it would change every person's life that is here today. God, if you are a Christian, God has given you a gift and one of the main reasons he's given you a gift is so you would use it to help other people around you. Point number two, it's not just to help each other, but it's to help the church. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, the Apostle Paul writes to the churches. Now, you've got to understand, the church in Ephesus isn't one church, but it was an area where there was multiple churches. And so he's not just speaking to one gathering of people, but he's speaking like to the Silver Valley churches. And so in speaking to all of these, these churches throughout the area, he's talking about what Jesus himself has given to the church. And it says that he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So I'm not giving you an entire list of giftings and I could further explain what he's describing right here. Some people call it the fivefold ministry, but it's five specific giftings. And what you've got to pay attention because a lot of churches, uh, the person who helps guide them is called pastor. He's only one of the five that are listed here, but you have to realize that in this list that he's describing it's for a reason and that reason is for the equipping of people who believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior to do the work of the ministry they're the ones to do the work of the ministry see because there's often this misconception in churches that the pastor is the one that's hired to do all of the ministry in the church and so in some churches, it's the pastor that vacuums, that does the uh, mowing of the grass or whatever, that takes care of the plumbing, that paints, that you know, takes care of the building, the visitation, the teaching, and, and goes out and spends time with people, whatever, the counseling, all that kind of stuff. Whatever it is that you think ministry is, if I were to say, give me a list of what you think ministry is, what you think a minister should do, then the reality is, that what you're describing is what you should be doing. Because the pastor's job, as only one of the five that's been given to the church in this list, is to train the other believers to go and do the work of ministry. 
So if you're a Christian and you've been given a gift, which you have, then your responsibility with that gift is to do the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? In our 201 class, we teach every member is a minister to try and really get this concept into people's heads. Because if you want to have a healthy church, a vital church, it's important for people to understand that it's up to the members of the church to be able to minister to each other. Because the reality is this, if you get to know anybody in our church at all, you'll realize in no time at all that there's a whole lot of needs in people's lives. There's so many needs that it's overwhelming for one person. One person couldn't do it alone. God's called us to help take care of each other. And so you know, I've been blessed in the fact that I can look across our church. I don't pastor a church that's like a lot of smaller churches, like ours. I don't do the mechanics. I don't do the construction. I don't know how to do most of this stuff. And you guys, most of you have heard me say that enough that you realize I don't know anything about carpentry or mechanical stuff. And I don't vacuum the church. I don't do any of that. And I am blessed to look around and find out, you know, that there's people in our church that do those things. That's their gifting. And that's their way of serving the church, helping the church be healthy and, and be what God has called us to be. You know, I, I think about, um, I was at drug court this last week and I was reading through and there's a, a person in drug court that's now staying with somebody because you have to have a place to stay uh, that's a healthy place to stay, and it, it named the people that this person is staying with, and as I was reading through our report, I'm like, those people are in our church. Where did this come from? And, and it just blessed my heart to realize, like, this is a newer couple in our church, and yet they got the concept that ministry is what they do. And so without me even knowing, like, they've invited somebody that I know into their home to help minister to them and help them through this broken time in their life. I see that all the time. I, I think of, like, George and Marilyn. George does a lot around the church. Doug does a lot around the church. Maggie, you know, I could go on the list and list and list of all the people that do stuff in the church. Uh, but I think of Marilyn, how many times, like, she has to tell me because she talks on the phone a lot. And... And some guys may think when their wife's on the phone all the time, that's a curse. But really, that may be a gift, the gift of gab. Uh, and so she's on there talking all the time throughout the day. And the reality is, she's the one that will sometimes have to tell me what's going on in a person's life. Like, hey, did you know this is going on? So I can pray or, you know, um, be able to go and visit that person and spend time with them. And there's so many people that use their giftings around here that come from small groups. But can you even imagine what it would be like if every single person in our church understood the concept that they've been gifted to help out the church as a whole? You know, Paul goes on in that same chapter, Ephesians chapter 4. And he says, you know, you've been given the fivefold ministry, apostles, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And then he goes on and he says, also for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everybody say edifying. Again, we see that the gifts are given to edify the whole church, right? We're not just talking about individuals, but the church as a whole. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12, he says it again. He says, even so you, since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Everybody say edification. So there's this idea there that we want to excel in our purpose. We want to excel in our giftings. We want to have this overflow coming out of us. And what Paul is saying is you really need to understand something. This gift isn't for you. This gift is for other people. And if you want to excel, then excel in an edifying the church as a whole. And whatever gift it is that you have been given. And you know what's interesting? When I looked up the word edified, I, I could have given you a patent definition that I know off the top of my head from preaching enough. But in the Greek, it's broken down in one word, two different words, 
uh, oko dome. Dome means to build. And then this is where I thought it got interesting. I always knew that it meant to build up. But the, the first part of that word has to do with a dwelling. And specifically, in context, a family dwelling. So it's to build up a family dwelling. Now, if you were to read the scripture and throw the definition in place of the word, it would say something like this. Jesus gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the building of the family dwelling of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. You wonder why you've been given a gift? Listen, let it be for the building of the family dwelling that you may seek to excel. What's the idea? In other words, if you want to excel in your purpose and the gift that you've been given, then use your gift to help create a dwelling place for the family of God. Now, unfortunately, in the church, we can be just as divided as the rest of the world. And the truth is that even understanding the giftings if we're not careful, they can divide us. Because it seems like sometimes people have a gift and they, they grow in that gift, then that gift becomes a part of who they are, and that's the only thing they can see out of. So the gifting kind of goes with the personality. And I don't know if it's necessarily that there's certain people that just have a personality and God gives that gift to already, or that that gift helps shape their personality. Nevertheless, they seem to go hand in hand. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like and how it can be detrimental to us if we're not careful is you look at a gift like the prophetic and like I already described. In the prophetic, people who flow in those types of giftings, no matter what to what degree, typically they will think that people need to repent more. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like we need to live a life of repentance. And their gifting is to help make sure the, the church is living that life of repentance. And so they'll focus on that sometimes. People need to repent more. They need to pray more. They need to spend more time with God. But then you get the evangelist, and the evangelist will think, you know, why in the world does the prophet spend so much time praying and not enough of spreading the good news? Like, yes, we need to repent, but let's get some good in here, okay? I understand the bad, but we need to lead people to Christ. Like, quit praying and start giving the salvation message. And so the evangelist will, will go out there, and he thinks that every single person in the church needs to lead people to Christ. And if they're not leading people to Christ, then they're not doing their job, and they're probably not even a Christian. And the reality, I just went through uh, my last pastor's training in Olympia, which I think is three months ago now. The pastors go up and we meet with Pastor Dave and then we write down on the board like if we got an issue and we, you know, put to how much of an issue, to what degree that is, we put a number on it. And then the pastors all sit and discuss the issue of the one pastor who's in serious trouble. And we don't give advice, we ask questions. And so it's interesting, like this uh, pastor last time, he was in a serious place where his leadership's not doing anything in the church and his church is failing because his leaders won't do anything. And so as we begin to ask questions, um, we ask him, what does he do? And he's a realtor, and so he spends his time doing realty. And then on the side, he's also an Uber driver. Not for extra income, but because when he gets people in the car, they're trapped, and he begins to give them the good news, and he leads people to Christ through being an Uber driver. And then when he goes to church, He's able to tell his leaders how many people he's led to Christ in the last week. And he asked them, how many have you led to Christ? And if his leaders haven't led anybody to Christ, then they're failing the church. And he's like, my leaders do nothing. Like they don't even get it. They don't get the gospel. Sometimes I don't even know if I'm pastoring a church of saved people. And the church is flailing. But why? Why? Because he's seeing the gospel through his gift. And that's the only thing he thinks is uh, the gift that matters or the gift that counts. And then you get the person who's got mercy. 
And the person who has the gift of mercy, they think, man, if the prophet and the evangelist would just have a little bit more love, maybe they would accomplish helping people more often. Like, just love people a little bit more when you tell them you're a sinner, and maybe you'd get them further. If you would just love on people a little bit more, you know, when you're trying to tell them about Jesus dying on the cross for them, maybe they wouldn't feel like they're being beaten over the head with a Bible. Right? So that gift of mercy is like, these guys are kind of messed up. But me, I'm going to show you the love of Christ. And then you got the gift of helps. And the gift of helps, they think that the prophet needs to quit spending so much time in prayer. The evangelist needs to quit pe hitting people over the head with the Bible. And that the, the gift of mercy people need to quit hugging on people so much. Quit spending so much time over there hugging somebody. And just do something in the church. Like nothing's getting done because everybody else is off doing all these other things, right? And so if we're not careful in our diversity, it's tempting for us to focus on how different we are and allow the giftings to divide us rather than what they were meant to do, which is unite us and make us stronger. And that's exactly how Paul describes the gifts in 1 Corinthians. Now I'm going to read this to you from the message. And sometimes when I read the message, it's not a true translation, but it's preaching for me. So here's what I want you to do. It's quite long. And I want to read this to you. Uh, if you would, just close your eyes. I didn't put it on the screens for a reason. Listen to what Paul is saying to you about the fact that you've been given a gift. Just, just quiet and listen. He writes to Christians and he says, You can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ, by means of his one spirit. We all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us is now a part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek, slave or free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If foot said, I'm not elegant like hand embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body, would that actually make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like eye, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine eye telling hand, get lost, I don't need you? Or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out? As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic and therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part's visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion over full-bodied hair? 
The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. I don't know about you, but I just feel like such a great description of what Paul's trying to get across to the church there. The different giftings are meant to make us whole. And like when people aren't using their gifting in the church, guess what? We're not whole. When there's people that are Christians, but they don't go to a church body, a family gathering, somewhere, guess what? We're not whole. If we're not growing at times, we may be missing the evangelist. If we're a church that's full of sin everywhere, like exorbitant sin, visible sin, everywhere, guess what? We might be missing the prophet. If we're a church that has a dirty building and it stinks when you walk inside, guess what? We might be missing the maintenance man. And first impressions are a big deal when it comes to people coming to meet your family. The giftings are meant to make us whole and unify us by getting us to depend on each other. And can you imagine how the church would function if we functioned fully in this manner? I'll show you what that looks like here. Okay, switch channels. Are you kidding? What makes you think you can come right in here and take over? These five fingers. Individually, they are nothing. But when I curl them together into a single unit, they become a fighting force, terrible to behold. Which channel do you want? Why can't you guys get organized like that? When we use our spiritual gifts as God intended, I believe the church would be an unstoppable, unified force. Number three, and the final point, you're given a gift to help others and to help the church, but ultimately you've got to understand the reason you've been given a gift is to glorify God. Simply to glorify him. Do you know... Like, Jesus is our perfect example of this. Jesus lived his life upon the earth, and everything that he said and everything that he did was glorifying his Father in heaven. And the way that he glorified his Father in heaven was by exemplifying all of the gifts that were inside of him at one time as one man upon the face of the earth. And people could recognize that God was with Jesus, that the Father and Him were one by the power of the words that came out of His mouth and by the heart that was in His actions. It was recognizable. This isn't just some ordinary man. And now Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. He's ascended into heaven. And he says, I go that one that's greater may come. And the Holy Spirit is now the physical manifestation of the presence of God upon the earth. And as we accept him into our lives, we accept the same power that was in Jesus. And we may not have all of the gifts, but we have some of the gifts. And think about the disciples after Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit came out, Peter came out and preached. You know, what was it said of them? Like these men have been with God. It was recognizable that they had been with God, that they were different from everybody else. And it was recognizable because of the gift that they were using to reflect the power of the Holy Spirit that was inside of them. It's no wonder that Paul actually refers to the gifts when he talks about the spiritual gifts as the manifestation of the Spirit. You know, I've been giving you guys 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 
out of the New Living Translation. And it's not a mistranslation, but it's worded different from uh, the older translations. Translations that are closer to the original language. In the New King James Version, it says, Paul writes to the church, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Like before I said in the New Living Translation, it's given to everyone to help each other. That same word is there, profit and help are the same word, to help add value to people's lives because you're able to help bear their burden and carry them along. But more importantly, what I want to point out here is that in the New Living Translation, the word they used is you've been given gifts, spiritual gifts. And the reason why it translated it that way, because in the context of this chapter, that's what Paul is referring to. But the reality is in the original language, it actually says the manifestation of the Spirit. And then he goes on to describe what the manifestation of the Holy Spirit looks like upon the earth is by the church functioning in the gifts that they've been given. The way the world is going to see God is what he's saying. Manifesting himself is when the church is operating in the gifts that he has specially and specifically given to each and every one of them. And when spiritual gifts are active in individuals' lives, when they gather together and they're still active as a church, like it's an indication that the Spirit is active amongst them. And you've got to understand what that means. If our gifts are meant to glorify God and we come to gather together, then what that does in glorifying God and the use of our gifts when we're with each other is it's an encouragement. To believers I don't know about you but I think about when we're gathered together and there's a prophetic word that's spoken and it helps me realize in that moment you know what God is near he's not some God that's out there he's not some God that I don't know he's not some God that's just in my mind but like he's near he's real he's alive I serve a living God and not only is he near, but he's aware. He knows what's going on. He knows what we need. He is like actively, carefully, and thoroughly fulfilling his will upon the earth. It's huge. When we use our gifts to glorify him amongst each other. And then to the unbelievers. You know, I think about what it does for unbelievers. Paul describes this in Corinthians, which we'll probably get into when we go through the actual list of the gifts. But it talks about like when tongues are used and then interpreted, that it's a gift to unbelief. It's, a, it's, a, it's glorifying God to unbelievers. Because they're able to like come face to face with the fact like how would, how would anybody have known what was said? Or when there's somebody that gives a specific prophetic word, that kind of prophecy, a word of knowledge, and like nobody but God would know those, that information. And they're able to see like, wow, there is a living God, and God is glorified because the gift was activated. Now, it's easy to pick certain gifts as, as glorifying God and, and letting believers and non-believers know that God is real, but your gift alone could do the same thing. I was thinking, what if I didn't have the gift of prophecy? What if I just had the gift of mercy? And I was praying this morning, God, give me a picture, give me a story, something to tell, something to share that's outside of the box of the gifts that sometimes are glorified. You know what I thought of was this, the gift of mercy is the ability to just love people right where they're at. Mercy means you don't get what you deserve in the negative way. Like you deserve a spanking, but you're not going to get one. You're going to get a hug instead. You're going to get loved on. In the big picture, you deserve death because you're a sinner, but Christ died because he loved you. You didn't get what you deserved. 
mercy is a tough gift. Like, I don't really have it very well. So I try to relate, and what God showed me a picture of is Mother Teresa. Like, here's a person who had the gift of mercy. And to all of the world, she is known as a follower of Christ who had the ability to love on the poorest of poor because she actively used the gift that God had given her. You may think, what good is my gift? But there is a why to your gift. And that why is because whether you realize its importance or not, it's meant to help the people around you. It's meant to help our church because without you, we're not as healthy as we should be. And it's meant to glorify God to both believers and non-believers. Your life has a purpose. And I want to encourage you throughout this series, know that you've been gifted. You've been given a purpose. Pursue that gift. And then ask yourself the question, are you using that gift for that purpose? Because he didn't give it to you to just hold on to. Are you using the gift for others, the church, and to glorify him? That's where your satisfaction in life will come from. Let's pray.